Um, thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. I really appreciate it. And thanks to Angela and Dara for um, um, the opportunity. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, communicative capitalism. And it's one small component of the communist horizon that's out there, but maybe in discussion we can you know, broaden, um, basically we have a broader discussion than just what I'm talking about here. Um, as I'll explain, I use communicative capitalism as um, to designate the contemporary ideological formation that's present in the hegemonic merger of, the of new economy, discourse, and participatory democracy. It's also more, I mean, when, when I'm talking about it, I also have in mind more than just this kind of contemporary dominant ideology. I also think it's present in activist and anarchist emphases on horizontality and process. Um, so I think that the assumptions of communicative capitalism are also part of a left attempt to convince itself that it can be political and act politically without discipline and organization. In other words, I think that this larger communicative capitalism that I'm describing um, is part of the left's accommodation with, um, with capitalism. So it's not simply a critique of, of a dominant ideology of the mainstream. I also think it goes further and affects the left. Okay, so that's what I hope maybe we can also talk about in the discussion. Over the last 30, or year, 30 years or so, in fact, throughout the period of neoliberal capitalism's consolidation, participatory media has offered quick, easy, universal democracy. Anyone with a mobile phone or access to the internet can make her voice heard. And of course, everyone has a voice, and the, inter and the internet lets us express them all. In this setting, democracy is a marketing slogan the means of extension for AT&T and T-Mobile and Microsoft. When linked to new media, democracy tags a politics light that, it, that anyone can get behind, right? There's no controversy or antagonism. It's also especially attractive to purveyors of mobile phones, notebook computers, software, and social media platforms. The injunction to get connected and participate is an injunction to buy, as well as to make oneself available to marketers, to um, um, make oneself available for marketers to capture our data and sell it. Now, I designate this convergence of multiply, in, of, of multiply interlinked media, neoliberalism, and democracy, communicative capitalism. Communicative capitalism is a material ideological formation. In it, the values heralded as central to democracy take practical material form in networked communication technologies. So ideals of access, voice, inclusion, discussion, and participation are practically realized through global telecommunications. Changes in information and communication networks associated with digitalization, personalization, localization, speed, and memory storage capacity impact capitalism and democracy, accelerating and amplifying elements of each as they consolidate the two into a new formation. This formation mobilizes democratic ideas and actively represses and excludes class power and economic inequality. Our setting is one of the convergence of capitalism and communication in a formation that incites participation only to capture it in the affective networks of, of personalized media. These networks have a weird contradictory effect. On the one hand, social media networks and communicative capitalism more generally produce a common, a collective information and communication mesh through which affects and ideas circulate. On the other hand, these networks presuppose and intensify individualism such that widely shared ideas and concerns are conceived less in terms of a self-conscious collective, less in terms of class, than they are as viruses, mobs, trends, moments, and swarms. Channeled through cellular networks and fiber optic cables onto screens and into sites for access, storage, retrieval, and counting, Communication today is captured in the capitalist circuits it produces and amplifies. This entrapment in capitalist circuits is the condition of possibility for communication's transformation of production. 
Because contemporary capitalism is communicative, democratic rhetorics of access, transparency, voice, discussion, reflection, participation, all of these strengthen the hold of capitalism in network societies. So the problem that democratic rhetoric identifies and the solutions it entails channel political energies into activities that reinforce the conditions of inequality they ostensibly contest. Disruptive events, intense debates are economic opportunities, ratings drivers, chances for pundits to opine and opinions to be expressed and circulated as much as they are political exercises. Communicative capitalism's <coughs> realization of democracy eats up democracy's use value. When communication is a primary component of the production and circulation of capital, it loses its capacity to function as a primary means for the rule of the people. Democracy is the ambient milieu of inescapable participatory media, and so it's unable to express the people's desire and need for economic basics like food, shelter, education, work, and health, not to mention economic equality, ecological sustainability, and the end of exploitation. So to convince you that all of the efforts to persuade us that the internet is good for democracy actually protect neoliberal capitalism's aggressive redistribution of wealth, I'm going to set out three features of communicative capitalism. Right, so sure. Yeah, that's a lot of distraction. Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you that of this statement I've just made about you know, these sort of statements about the communicative capture of our utterances. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of three features of communicative capitalism. And the features are the change in the form of our utterances from messages to contributions, the decline of symbolic efficiency, and the reflexive trap of the circuits of drive. And I'll then talk about some of the kinds of exploitation that are particular to communicative capitalism. Whereas industrial capitalism exploited labor, the industry of workers, communicative capitalism adds in the exploitation of communication. Our very efforts to engage, respond, connect, and critique, in other words, it adds in the exploitation of the essential media of our sociality. So again, my claim is that communicative capitalism materializes democratic ideals so as to strengthen and support global capital. What we have now, discussion, inclusion, opportunities for dissent, is democratic. But democracy is inadequate for an emancipatory egalitarian politics. Now, before I, I give these sort of formal properties of communicative capitalism and the description of kinds of, explo as of exploitation, what I want to address are some of the recent protests of the last few years, because I bet that some of you are already really skeptical. They're like, well, hasn't she heard of Turkey? Right? What about the, you know, the Arab uprisings? What about Occupy Wall Street? Um, don't these demonstrate that networked social media are powerful forces for egalitarian people's struggles and that democracy is a powerful political ideal? Well, I will have two answers, yes and no, right? I'm an academic, it has to be both of these things. Um, okay, so yes, democracy is a powerful political ideal, particularly for those of us who like to project it onto the energies that others have that we seem to lack. We should hesitate, though, as our enthusiasm for political change merges into an enthusiasm for the media we use to participate in the events condensing and displacing the events such that the media, particularly Facebook and Twitter, become the story, not the people fighting and dying in the streets. When the unfolding events are condensed into a story about social media, we lose sight of the economic inequality crucial to the revolutionary situation. We contain a struggle against capitalism within a democratic script. This lets us convince ourselves that networked participatory media are primarily in our interest, that they serve egalitarian ends, that revolutionary change is available through a quick technological fix, right? Like there's an app for that. It lets us convince ourselves that networked media are not a form of capture and distraction, and that our communicative entertainment practices are the best political ones. 
It lets us persist in our denial of the fact that accompanying our distraction in the media nets has been the greatest increase in economic inequality in world history. So yes, democracy is a powerful political ideal, one that is materialized in social media technologies that let us cover over our current political impotence and imagine ourselves as active political participants. No, revolutions and protests are not indications that social media are powerful forces for egalitarian people's struggle. Rather, these struggles unfold in a turbulent information and communication environment where information and communication are weapons and forces as well as setting and environment. The struggles over what they mean and what will come next are ongoing. In fact, they're so ongoing that we need to be cognizant of the ways that enthusiasm is generated, augmented, and circulated. I'm, I'm thinking here of some of the ways that enthusiasm was generated for the um, revolutions in Egypt. I don't know if people followed this group called AYM, Alliance for Youth Movements. But Alliance for Youth Movements has a website called movements.org and it's involved in training activists. And it trains activists you know, in terms of um, how, to, um, how to communicate with one another if the internets are down, how to you know, ha produce a narrative for your, for your um, protests, how to, connect, you know, how to build distribution lists, what the best phones are. They also have sponsors that are Google, Facebook, MTV, and the U.S. State Department. The chief of AYM, right, the, um, one of the founders of it, used to um, work um, directly under Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. He wrote a well, his name is Jared Cohen. Um, he actually has a book where he makes all of this quite explicit, right? This is no mystery. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to think this, right? This is just totally, you know, public knowledge. And he um, has argued that, look, it's important for combating communism and combating Arab fundamentalism to recognize that all young people want to be part of global consumer culture and need to be online. So he's a deliberately training activists in mobile technologies in order to depoliticize activist youth movements. Okay, so that's one of the ways to think about how enthusiasm is generated um, by transferring the enthusiasm from the struggles on the streets into the media that people are using in the struggles. Okay, with respect to Occupy Wall Street, you know, some people argued that what was most significant about the movement was the use of social media. Um, that's a mistake that works to de-radicalize a movement whose significance came from its break with move on style collectivism. Rather than remaining inside in front of their screens, people went outside. That's kind of you know, amazing in the United States. You know, people were at no longer just sort of trapped in their apartments. People experienced working together directly, face to face, working with strangers for a political purpose. The movement was a collective realization that circulating petitions on the internet is inadequate as a political practice. And the same is true for the protest in Turkey. What mattered was the people in the streets building barricades, right, choking on the gas, bodily confronting the forces of the state. Social media are not powerful forces specifically for egalitarian people's struggles, particularly when they occlude class antagonism. Anyone can use them. States, capitalists, nationalists, fascists. Appeals to social media as essentially or necessarily media that enable the people to shape the world they want posit a fantastic moment of unity and security in what's actually a turbulent field. That is, they put in place a language of cooperation and connection as if conservatives, neoliberals, and states didn't use social media, as if like Google weren't a privately owned company, as if Facebook you know, wasn't empowering one person to be a billionaire and everyone else to give up their data for free. Um, the language of unity and security displaces our attention from nefarious and conservative and private property, you know, com um, nefarious and conservative media practice and the structures of ownership in which, it, which is it embedded, as if only old media could be manipulated, as if all our contemporary communicative pleasures were innocent. Okay, so now that we are all in full agreement that, um, <laughs> um, that you know, network media might be fun, 
but there are not forces that that's not where we need to look for egalitarian people's struggle. Let me describe some of the basic features of communicative capitalism. Three primary features. First, in communicative capitalism, messages are contributions. As developed by Claude Shannon in 1949, the mathematical model of communication emphasizes a speaker who sends a message to a receiver. Warren Weaver added to Shannon's work the additional factor of response. Messages are sent with an aim toward eliciting some kind of response in their hearer. Right, so the classic communication model is, what's communication? It's a message sent by a sender to a hearer to elicit a response. Now, under communicative capitalism, things are different. Now, messages are contributions to circulating content, not actions that elicit responses. So it's like there's been a shift from the primacy of a message's use value to the primacy of its exchange value, that is, its capacity to circulate, to be forwarded, to be counted. Unlike a message which needs to be understood, a contribution just has to, has to be added. Right? You add your two cents. I bet I'm not the only one in this room who has you know, liked or forwarded, you know, liked or shared things on Facebook by only reading the headline. Right? Like, oh, I like the person who put it on there. Actually, that was the first thing when I saw the um, review of your, um, the Terry Eagleton review of your book. Right? I saw a friend of mine um, put it on his Facebook page. He's like, oh, Terry Eagleton, anti Bono. I like Doug. Okay, like forward. Right? And then, <laughs> and then like, you know, like 24 hours later, then I read it and I'm like, wow, yeah, this really is really good. This is great. Um, okay, so, right, but so the, so the, basic, the basic model here is that messages aren't messages eliciting responses, they're just contributions to a data flow. One contributes one's opinion or idea to whatever discussion is going on. This additive feature of the contribution depends on a fundamental communicative equivalence. As a contribution, each message is communicatively equal to any other. No opinion or judgment is worth more than any other. Right, so like if um, like I'm a blogger, and when you think about the success of a blog post, it's like, well, how many comments are there, or how many times has it been forwarded? It doesn't matter if half of the ones are trolly comments or just stupid or lame comments, right? Each one just counts as one comment, or it's the same thing in any academic setting, right? How many people show up? How many people speak? Right? It's a it's a logic um, of the count. And this makes every specific utterance equal because their content doesn't matter. Facts, theories, judgments, opinions, fantasies, jokes, lies, they circulate indiscriminately. Again, the point is that as a contribution, each is equal. Each adds something to the flow. What matters is not what was said, but that something was said. Right? Points were made, questions were raised. You can think this is also um, another example of this are word clouds, right? And I don't know if you, if you have this here, but in the US, after any politician's speeches or debates, it's like, here's a word cloud, right? They said austerity 24 times. It's like, well, were they criticizing it? <laughs> I mean, I have like no idea, right? It just matters is the, is the amount. Expressed as a logic of the count, Democracy loses its capacity to provide a critical wedge against capitalism. The more opinions voiced, the more voices heard, the more democratic, and it doesn't matter what they say because each con contribution is communicably equivalent to any other. Consequently, and now here's the second aspect or second attribute of, of communication, of communicative capitalism. Consequently, Communicative capital, capitalism is characterized by the decline of symbolic efficiency. Now, I get this term from Slavoj Žižek, and um, he is, is using it from a variation on something from Claude Lévi-Strauss. So to explain it, first I'll say what symbolic efficiency is and then what it means for it to decline. Symbolic efficiency refers to the way that symbols symbolize, right? How a symbol can travel from one context to another. So for example, um, like a crucifix is the same thing if it's hanging in the back of a church or on the neck of a rock star, right? The weird change in context actually doesn't change what it is. You still know what it is even though it's in two different places. The decline of symbolic efficiency then points to a decrease in the circulatory capacities of symbols. 
outside of a specific context, they're, op they're opaque, unmeaningful. They don't translate. And the example I um, like to give on this one is like, if Jurgen Habermas and Justin Bieber are in an airport waiting lounge, they are not going to recognize one another. There's not going to be a kind of symbolic currency that they share. Neither has a sense of the other's cultural capital. So the decline of symbolic efficiency designates an entrapment in immediacy and locality such that we're unable to employ terms or ideas that can bring us out of this isolated setting. Let me give another example of this. I was at a um, this kind of strange event um, on the idea of, of the commons in Europe. And it was spo sponsored by, I guess, the Heinrich Boll Stiftung. And it was in Croatia last year. And one of the things that was, and then of course, because this was like a kind of NGO environment, everyone broke out into buzz groups to kind of share things and write them on note paper, you know, big poster things. <laughs> and one of the things that was brought up in almost each group is that people didn't have a common language. Right? Folks didn't have a language that they shared enough to even get a decent discussion going. Much of it, uh, the kind of, and it was like a three day thing. And much of the, these days was spent trying to find some set of terms that, that people could share enough in a group. That's another example of the decline of symbolic efficiency. This absence or lack of a language through which people from different environments, um, and this is all, I mean, you know, it's not that the people coming to a, to, from a, to a Heinrich Boll Stiftung on the Commons are gonna be really that different. I mean, even there, there was, there was an absence of a common language, right? So people are trapped in this immediacy and locality. I should add that as the efficiency of the symbolic declines, images and affective intensities appear as all the more powerful, relevant, and effective, right? So you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's easier, smoother, more socially fluid to post and circulate images. It's easier to do that than it is to circulate sort of actual ideas, right? Because ideas are hard to get right in language. And the images don't confront us with the limits of our thinking. The limits also don't confront us with the, I mean, the images also don't confront us with the ways that we might actually be disagreeing with, you know, everybody that we know on Facebook. But if you just have the, half, the little image circulating, half the people might think that you're circulating it critically. Some might think it's ironic. Some people don't care. Some people think it's cute. Whatever it is, you don't, you don't have to confront any of those, um, those limits or differences or gaps in understanding. So it feels easier to circulate images. Okay, third component then of communicative capitalism um, that, I that I'm gonna emphasize here is reflexivity. Our contemporary setting of electronically mediated subjectivity is one of infinite doubt and ultimate reflexivization. There's always another option, link, opinion, nuance, or contingency that we haven't taken into account. We never have a real answer or conclusion. Everything can be contested or re-examined. Reflexivity then involves a kind of looping or a turning back in. If one doesn't like an outcome, one can criticize the process. And then one can criticize the process of questioning the process. One can then criticize the language of used in the pro the language used in the process of questioning ad infinitum. And the thing is, is that there are always good reasons for the next level of the loop, right? It's not that this is kind of, I'm not saying this ironically, right? This is a kind of reflexive trap that actually makes sense for us, but it also deflects action, right? It gets us involved in this kind of perpetual inward turning. Psychoanalysis uses the term drive to designate this repetition. In drive, um, enjoyment, or you know, because this is psychoanalysis, the French, you know, jouissance is the intense pleasure pain um, that makes life worth living. Um, in drive, this enjoyment comes from missing one's goal, from the repeated yet ever failing efforts to reach it that become satisfying on their own. Right? Like a good example of drive here would be a slot machine. Right? Nobody plays a slot machine as a rational engagement of trying to get more money by the end of an evening, right? You play the slot machine, you know, first you want to win, and then you want to recover the money, 
And then you think you don't want people who are around you think that you're cowardly or stupid. And then you're thinking, well, they're going to think that I've been playing this too long, so I really have to win to justify what I've done. And then you're going to think, like, oh my God, I've just you know spent the rent. And so then slowly but surely you keep in, you get caught in this reflexive circuit, reflecting on your own engagement. And then also this becomes gives us own little pleasure, right? The rings and bells and the images that keep showing up in the slot machine. In this environment. And now we can just think about this, this reflexive environment more broadly. Even the fact that my blog posts are boring or the arguments that I have with friends on um, Facebook are, have an intensity beyond merit, even the escapades of celebrities, all of these things are known to be trivial and yet they are discussed in, as media phenomena that are themselves worthy of discussion. Most of the time the content, right, presidential, disastrous, financial, the content of the repetitive intensities doesn't matter. It's a mass of virtually indistinguishable, yet rapidly circulating differences and modulations that ensure that nothing changes. Democracy follows this circuit of drive. We circle around and around, missing our goals, but still getting a little satisfaction. Some enjoy sharing outrage over a setback. Others enjoy rehashing all the steps that went into our failure, arguing over where we went wrong, even if it was at Kronstadt. Others want us to delve into the particulars of a process for its own sake, with little regard for the outcome. Democratic drive, then, names the reflexivity in which we are stuck, which we can't avoid, but which can't be understood as giving us what we want, even as it gives us this little kick of enjoyment. So we protest, we talk, we complain, we sign petitions and forward them to our friends. In the reflexive circuit of communicative capitalism, democratic drive is the capture of our political engagements in networked media so that we feel active, we feel engaged, even as our actions and engagements reinforce rather than undermine capitalism. So I'm making this argument about this kind of democratic drive as a way of saying I don't think that the current problems um, that the left encounters all over um, you know, Europe, the US, the UK, I don't think it's a matter of people not being involved. Right? I think people participate and are, are involved. I just think the forms of our involvement are captured in ways that reinforce the system rather than undermine it. So we're ca our utterances are captured, our engagements are captured, um, but it's not that people don't care. It's not that they're not, you know, that they're not involved. All right. So this is communicative capitalism. Um, with 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 um, with that in mind, I now want to talk about some of the modes of exploitation that are part of communicative capitalism. And um, I've, I'll talk about four of these. I'll take it's the people in there. It's like it's kind of hot. It's like ten minutes. Yeah. Folks are you know. You want to open a window? Can we open a window up, or is it too loud? I don't want to torture everybody. You, you can't take it anymore, all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, well, I guess we're all okay with that. <laughs> Tell them we said hey. Um, okay, so, uh, so um, keep, um, uh, some of the basic, um, I'm, I'll talk about four, but uh, they're us I usually talk about like five or six. Five of the methods, are the five of the kinds of, of exploitation and expropriation of the common, of, of what we produce in common in um, communicative capitalism. Um, five of these are data, da uh, data, metadata, networks, attention, and capacity. So those are the, the, five, ca the five buzzwords there. So first, um, Facebook and Amazon claim ownership of information placed on their sites. They claim as their own property the products of unremunerated like, creative communicative labor. Indeed, a primary characteristic of most commercially successful internet platforms is the capacity to become a singular locus for multiple communicative engagements. Some of these, and Google comes to mind here, collect and store metadata about user actions. So this is now a second kind of expropriation of metadata, right, of our search patterns, and of explo exploitation, right? It's an exploitation of user desire to navigate a rich information field. Google treats the trace left by searching, searching and linking as its own potential resource. 
a third broader instance of expropriation and exploitation of the communicative common involves the structure of complex networks. Now, complex networks is a, is a term of art in kind of communication theory, and it refers to networks that are characterized by free choice, growth, and preferential attachment. So it'd be something like um, blockbuster movies, right? Blockbuster movies, um, are, 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 people aren't forced to go to, um, aren't forced, are not forced to go to them. And then as people hear about them, um, more people are likely to go or not go. So there's a preferential attachment in that after you hear that someone else has liked it, you're likely to go. So the, and um, the same kind of structure is with um, um, bestsellers, even academic, novel, um, academic pieces. Um, all of these kinds of products are, are blo um, uh, Websites like uh, we have websites, search engines, hubs, all of these kinds of products are characterized by, or can be understood as complex networks, and they follow a power law distribution. So the item that's most popular is dramatically more popular than all of the stuff that's kind of that's left out, that's down at the bottom of the food chain. So um, zillions of novels are written, you know, one or two are massive bestsellers. And the same with movies, the same, alas, with academic writing. Most, you know, most everything, right? So there's one or two people who really break out and are fabulous. They're at the top. I call them the one, and everyone else is the common, right? Everybody else is, is the many. Um, the popular media talk calls this the 80-20 rule or the winner-take-all um, society, winner-take-most society. In all of these examples, then, the common is the general field out of which the one emerges. Exploitation consists in the efforts to stimulate the creative production of the field in the interest of finding and monetizing the one. Like for example, um, um, Programs in literature, programs in creative writing do this a lot, right? Particular MA programs. And what they try to do is tell a lot of people, oh, yes, you can be a, a famous writer if you just you know, attend this program. And they stimulate the field, getting more and more people to produce. And then one person ends up, you know, you know one person out of you know, tens, and 20, tens and tens of thousands will end up being the popular um, writer. Or the same thing for um, writing online, right? People are said, like, oh, our Huffington Post is one of the great sort of examples of this. So everybody writes for basically nothing and then if you get a particular number of hits on your post then you might get a little income and then if you're really one of the chosen few then you will actually get some kind of other book product um, other book um, um, contract so exploitation then um, consists in trying to expand the field and monetize the one and in fact it's the expansion of the field that produces the one right or in network language hubs are an imminent property of networks this kind of generation of the one, this kind of exploitation, contributes to the expropriation of opportunities for income and paid labor. And we see this in the collapse of print journalism and academic presses. I think that we need to recognize here a primary condition of labor under neoliberal capitalism. Now, rather than having a right to the proceeds of one's labor by virtue of a contract, ever more of us win or lose such that remuneration is treated like a prize. In academia, art, writing, architecture, entertainment, design, education, technology, people not only feel fortunate to get work, to get hired, to get paid, but ever more tasks and projects are conducted as competitions, which means that those doing the work are not paid unless they win. People work for a chance at pay. And I, I, mean, I guess it's the same here. You guys have um, internships, right? Work, right? Internships are the worst. Right? These are not the worst compared to like you know, factory labor in China. But I mean, they're, they're for in our contemporary, in our condition under um, societies that have um, you know, post-industrial, de-industrialized societies, internships are one of the ways that people are induced and forced to work for pay. I mean, to work for free. Um, and for the opportunity of being paid in the future. And one of the also things to notice here is a change in the difference between how a contract works and how this kind of prize works, right? With a contract, people f have a relation to the person who is giving, um, who basically a relation to the employer where the employer is obligated to pay. 
with a prize, the, the person who is, giving, who is awarding the prize is in the position of a kind of beneficent lord, right? A charitable giver like, oh, aren't you lucky? I get to bestow on you this prize. And sorry, you 99%, you guys get nothing. But this one gets the prize because I, now the lord, have determined you the winner. Inducement prizes, contests, are amplifications of the, um, of the entrepreneurial attitude, right? The entrepreneurial attitude characteristic of neoliberalism. They're also alterations. The work is done and then may be paid for, right? The winner and likely not the losers. The only link between work and remuneration comes from the prize giver who is now in this position of the, jo of, of the judge or lord. As a government policy or approach to funding, the logic of the prize is extended into an acceptable work relation, right? We come to feel no, that we have no alternative but to accept this prize logic as a condition of our labor under contemporary circumstances. Now, you might say, oh, wait a minute. No one forces anyone to enter into the competition. But what happens when that becomes a dominant approach to work? Those who don't choose have fewer opportunities to enter into contract-based work because the amount of contract-based work diminishes. The overall field is changed such that people have little choice but to compete under these terms. Fourth, the myriad entertainments and diversions available online or as apps for our phones are not free. Now, we don't usually pay money directly to YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. They don't cost money, they cost time. It takes time to post and write and time to read and respond. We pay with attention. And our attention isn't boundless. Our time is finite, even if we try to extract, va extract value out of every second. Right? So I, mean, I find that I can't wait any anywhere in line. It's like, OK, while I'm waiting in line, I can, in fact, um, delete a bunch of crap in my email. I can answer one or two things. I can you know, have a book. I can, answer, I can do things working all the time. Um, even if it's in tiny little segments, right? It's like every second counts. So even um, though we cannot respond to every utterance, click on every link, read every post, even though we have to choose, um, even though we have to choose even as other things lure us in, we nonetheless feel compelled to keep doing it, to keep involved in it. Demands on our attention, injunctions for us to communicate, participate, injunctions which are ever shriller and more intense. These are like speed ups on the production line. Attempts to extract from us whatever bit of mind share is left. When we do respond, our contribution is an addition to an already infinite communicative field. A little demand on someone else's attention, a little incitement of an affect of response, and a trace that can be stored and counted and so on. So we pay with attention and the cost is focus and the capitalist benefit. Now this cost is particularly high for progressive and left political movements. Competition for attention, how do we get our message across? Competition in a rich, tumultuous media environment too often and easily means adapting to this environment and making its dynamic our own, which can result in a shift from doing to appearing. That is a, a, that is a shift from getting attention, a shift um, in, that's, that makes us think in terms of, oh, we've got to get attention in a 24-7 media cycle. And we don't think then in terms of larger questions of building a political apparatus with duration. Infinite demands on our attention, demands that we make on each other, and that communicative capitalism captures and amplifies, expropriate political energies of focus, organization, and duration vital to communism as a movement and organized struggle. It's no wonder that communicative capitalism is participationist. The more participation in networked media environments, the more traces to hoard and energies to capture and divert. In sum, democracy is used up in communicative capitalism. And the repercussion is that we, and I mean this we as a divisive partisan we, have to organize and fight for something different and something more. The internet, 
And all contemporary personalized mass media are obviously not enough. We need the discipline and solidarity of the organized party. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.